working on. You're the last one I haven't taken the lab. You're the only person? Yes. No one else needs to take the lab tomorrow, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm staying up for you. I appreciate it. Okay. Unless, wait, like, is anyone going to retake the lab? Please, someone. Looks like no. <laughs> Are you okay? Huh? There's a night. What's that? That's paper machine. That is paper machine writing time, yes. Last time was project machine. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm kind of thin today, but that's all right. Um, so uh, today is just to discuss a little bit about your presentations. Uh, hopefully you're also working on your papers. Uh, if you have any questions on papers, I'm, I'm happy to answer them now. Yes, sir. Um, just to clarify about the spacing, I'm probably not answering this question, but it's okay. Is this like the ones that are really close together, single space in there? That's how you want to do it. So um, I have a <laughs> here. What would you call that spacing? Yeah. So you know, single spacing where everything is like right next to each other is very hard to read. Uh, double spacing where you got a lot of white space, it's just a lot of white space. So 1.15, whatever the standard thing when you open up Word or OES or something like that, uh, it's good. Uh, now the other thing I didn't, I don't know if I, I think I put in the instructions for the project, but you you should have about 12.5s because again I'm getting old, my eyes get bad. So if it's like 10 point or 9 point five, I'll get if it's 16.5, that's exciting, but uh, it, it means that you don't have quite as long of a paper as anyone else does. So keep it at 12, yeah. Um, well, for five spacing, we see the reader at home is not written. That's true. Um, and it's not double spacing. So, one, you, so you're asking for 1.5 as opposed to 1.15? Uh, sure. Sure. So no single spacing, no double spacing, somewhere in between. <laughs> Don't push it. All right. Uh, any other questions on the project paper? And I'm not annoyed by that question. It's actually good to make sure that stuff is clear. Because if I don't make it clear, then I get strange form, strangely formatted papers, which has happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Sure, if you know what MLA citation style is. Anybody else know what MLA citation style is? So I don't actually use like the names of citation methods, um, but I have some examples of how to cite in the FAQs at the end of the paper. So if you know MLA, MLA style, that's fine. If you know, what was the other one you just mentioned? MPA style? Okay. Uh, sure, uh, but you know it should be authors, year, you know, journal, volume, page, and then if you want to add in the title, that's actually very helpful because then I kind of understand what what the relevance of that to your paper is. But you know, you don't have to put in all fifty authors. You can put at all. Is that helping? Yeah, well, the main difference is when you're citing like in your. Oh, so you want to know whether you can use footnotes versus actual like text in the paper? That's up to you. I, I uh, you know, uh, sorry, sorry, endnotes where you put the number in that shows up at the end. That's fine. 
it makes the paper a little bit more readable. Um, in astronomy, we usually have like the author at all 2013 or something like that. Um, so I'm actually I'm not that. That's a detail I'm not as concerned about. Yeah. So whatever whatever you're used to. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Just make it readable. That's the important thing. Yeah, these are these. So I mean, it's again, it's important to know the details of this. But like header style, that's not what you should spend your time on. You should on the science. I've had teachers that have retracted large amounts of points. For oh, okay. I'm not one of those. People. Yeah. I mean, if you want to macrame it, that's fine. Uh, I won't give you any extra points for that, but I'll be impressed. <laughs> you know, do a burning or something yeah, like that. You can if you give me like you know uh, stone tablets with a chipped in, I'll make you carry them. But that's fine. <laughs> if I buy an iPad, just display the paper for you. I'll probably keep the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that's up to you. Is that only great in any way? No, but, but I'll be happy because I have a new iPad. That's great. Any other questions? Okay, so the reason I, I wanted to have a separate uh, talk on the presentations is because. I, I've done these projects several times in the past, and usually the papers are, are pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty fine. Uh, but the presentations tend to be all over the place, and I think part of it is that I don't know if you ever get formal training on making presentations. Is that true? You have. So one out of ten, two out of ten. Three out of ten. Oh, okay, okay. Well, so in that case, it's going to be your responsibility to pipe in if you have other suggestions on good presentations that you've learned or you've from practice. Uh, or uh, when I do, I'll do some examples. If you don't find the bad things in them, I will look at you more closely. OK? Um, but just, uh, just to put in a little structure here, so just so you know how I'm grading. So it's actually important to know, in any case, when you're doing an assignment, what is the professor looking for? What is or his rubric for grading your assignment. So here's my rubric. So there's three main parts. One is your organization, uh, one is your clarity, and one is whether I can assess that you've understood the material that you've actually presented. And so in terms of organization, you know, is, is the flow of your presentation, does it make sense? And we'll talk a little bit about suggested sort of flow. But you know, starting off with like what the topic is and explain what the topic is before you dive into the conclusions or like spending a lot of time on details without actually saying what the purpose of all this is. That's part of organization. All right, so how does the flow of the talk? And, and did you provide context? All right. So you remember, these talks are only about five minutes. So you don't have a lot of time. But you should at least provide a little bit like, you know, the paper I studied was about pulsars. Here's why pulsars are interesting. Or here's the problem about pulsars that's interesting. OK? Um, the clarity of presentation this is what we're going to focus on a lot today. But you know. Are your figures clearly explained? Do, you, do we understand what your figure is about? That's, that's an important thing about clarity. Uh, could we actually understand your slides? You know, or were they so chock full of stuff that we couldn't actually make it out? Or maybe they were in plaid and so it was hard to see them, right? These kind of things. And, and not just presentation in terms of like the material you show, but did you present your presentation clearly? So did you speak in a way that we could hear you <laughs> and see you and stuff like that, OK? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then understanding the material. So this is a little bit, you know, kind of a judgment call on my part. Um, but it turns out to be pretty easy to call most of the time. Um, you know, were you able to grasp the basic physics of the project that you, 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 you studied, right? So, you know, did you, when you talk about the context in particular, uh, I'll be looking to see that you actually understood the basic physics. Now, if you're doing general relativity, I'm not going to look to see if you know how to make your metric correctly, right? But more of just the general conceptual physics. Did you understand the, the material that you covered? Uh, and then part of this presentation is also answering questions from the audience. And so I'm going to expect everyone in here as they're watching talks to ask questions at the end. And I'll be keeping track of who is asking questions at the end. That will figure into the grade somehow. Um, so can you answer those questions in a, in, a, in a coherent manner as best as you can? OK, so those are the kind of things that I'll be looking looking for. Questions on that? OK. All right, uh, now, uh, one thing so I, I, I mentioned in the, in the document, uh, the information document, that I'll need your presentations by 5 o'clock. I think what I said is I need your PDF, at least a PDF version. 
what I've decided to do is that I'm actually going to do all the presentations on this computer, because in the past, it usually takes like two minutes to switch between computers. And, you know, 16 times two minutes, that's half an hour that we just spin around, spinning around. So um, I'm going to need you to email me, or email is probably the easiest way, if you really want to bring a jump drive in. Well, we don't have class next week, so that might be a little hard, but if you want to bring it into my office or something like that, we can figure out a time. Um, but uh, these are the formats that I can handle. PowerPoint PDF for sure. Keynote is a little iffy because Keynote, Apple has this wonderful thing about not having backwards compatibility. So every time they have a new key, Keynote version, it doesn't work in any other previous Keynote versions. So that's a little risky. Um, anybody here ever do a Prezi? It was on Reddit yesterday. It was on Reddit yesterday? Yeah, they found some like, source code was released or something. Our program was on a field site about what it is. Sorry, say the last part? Or, uh, the subreddit program was having a field of how wonderful Prezi is. Oh, OK. They're pretty. So if you know Prezi, they make pretty presentations. But if you don't, that's OK. Um, really easy way to do presentations in general is if you, if you have them up on a web page, if you actually make an HTML-based uh, presentation, or if you use Google Documents, they have presentation sort of uh, documents on Google. And that's accessible from anywhere. So you know you have your presentation. You can go fly to Turkey and give your presentation there and not have to carry any with you. It's, it's really phenomenal to do that. So uh, that's a possibility. These are also possibilities. Right? We have had chalkboard presentations before, and they're fine. Okay? So if you want to go super low tech, that's great too. Okay. Yes, sir? Question and suggestion. Do you yeah. have a, a growth look at a previous presentation? I do, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Won't shoot at you. Yes, it will. Uh, it should. We'll test it. I mean, if it doesn't, the arrows work just fine, too, so that's not that big a deal. But um, I think they've worked with PDS before. But we can test it. Okay. Does anybody have a format that's not on here and they're panicking? That's good. Okay. All right. Uh, now, a little structure for your talk. So remember, these are five minutes. Uh, a good rule of thumb for a talk is really kind of two minutes per slide. Uh, but five minutes is a pretty short time because then you have two and a half slides, which isn't very much. Uh, but you should always start with the title slide first, at least, to sort of give some context of what, what the talk is going to be about. Uh, and then uh, based on how many of each of these categories you have, uh, you should aim to have something like five or less slides. Uh, one minute per slide is actually a pretty fast rate, uh, unless you're one of these people that does like animations or something like that. So that's, that's OK. Um, but here's my suggestion. You don't have to take it, but this is a good organization to think about. Uh, you need to talk about your context, and that's always a good thing to talk about first. So one or two slides that sort of presents the, the topic at which your, your talk is about. So if you're giving a talk on uh, strange stars, you want to have at least one slide that explains what a strange star is. Right. And then you know the other part of that is you know these projects should be based on specific papers, and so you want to dive into what, how does this sort of big topic relate to the paper you actually read. A, more, a good way of saying that is what is the problem or what is the question that that paper was trying to address, right? So that's part of the context, taking you know, all of the universe down to one type of thing that you're studying down to what is the question about that thing that you're actually, your project's about, right? A little funnel model here, right? And then um, you should have one or two slides that really talk about what, what did you do in terms of researching this paper uh, or you know, interpreting the paper or doing something with the paper. What was actually the part of your project that you, that you worked on? What did you learn? What were the pieces of this paper that were particularly interesting? How did the authors analyze what they did? Stuff like that. All right? And you should also in include here some relevance to the material, you know, some connection to the material you covered in class. So you're all doing STAR you know, related projects, so that's not too hard. But, you know, for example, you might have a paper that talks about binary stars, and you should talk a little bit about how that relates to maybe the evolution of, of massive binaries, if that's the topic of your paper. But tying it somewhat to things that we've covered, or themes we've covered in class is, is an important thing. That helps the audience sort of also get context as well. Okay? And then uh, you should have just one slide that sort of wraps things up, synthesizes things. It might be a summary of the sort of stuff that you talked about. It might be the larger perspective, so now going in the outside of the funnel. 
So taking the results from this paper and saying, what are the big conclusions one can draw from this? Those are usually presented in the paper themselves, so that's just maybe part of it. Um, and, you know, many, many scientists' talks are, okay, I did this one thing, now I need more observing time. Which is really like, what future, what's the future of this? You know, is this problem solved? Or is this raised a new problem? And how do we go on and address that problem? Right. Again, these are things that you, you, you may come up with on your own, or maybe things that are touched upon in the paper. But it, again, it provides a sort of nice structure for what are the big questions, how did this paper address it, and where do we go from here? Okay? Joanna? Okay. All right. All right. Plenty of helpful pointers. And so if you have other suggestions, if you have any other suggestions, please pipe in. Um, and we're, we're going to practice these after the slide, so, so uh, don't worry if this is just all, all me talking. Um, the first thing is, you know, you're going to have some figures, hopefully, in your talk that are relevant to your project. You should explain what, what that figure is. And so if it's a plot, all right, so if I draw, you know, if I draw a plot of the initial mass function, right? Got it? Good. Why? What's wrong? There it is. There's my figure. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that. All right. It might be log mass versus log number. Am I done? Okay, I'm done. Oh yeah. Okay. So maybe I should make this uh, one solar mass. We'll call this zero. And we'll call this uh, minus one and one. And we'll put some numbers on here. I don't know what this is. And the minus two, I think. Thank you for asking. Right, I drew this, and I didn't really explain why I drew this. Right, I drew this because we're talking about the mass function, and this is the distribution of stars as a function of mass, and it peaks over here at point one, point three. Okay, you get the point, right? So I'm actually using my figure. I'm not just popping it up here and saying, here's the mass function, moving on. All right, explaining what the axes are, explaining the relevance of this, where it comes from. That's what I mean by explaining your figures. Okay, it's not just for a pretty, pretty pretty plot, which is, you know, only scientists think plots are pretty, um, but to actually put the context into what you're talking about. And so that we understand what you're talking about, too, is explaining the figure. Um, you want to cite where all these figures, uh, if you have equations, you want to cite where that equation comes from. I mean, unless it's like Kepler's law. If you really want to cite Kepler's 1680, that's fine. 1580, it's fine. Um, but if it's equation relevant to that paper, for example, uh, you want to cite that. And if there's an idea that you cite, right? If there's some, you know, statement of fact that, that you discuss in your project that comes from one of these papers, make sure you have a citation for that, right? Because otherwise it's not clear where that idea comes from. Um, tables aren't great for talks, just so you know. Uh, a lot of folks love, this is a great creative opportunity, right? We don't get a lot of creative opportunities as scientists, so giving talks is a wonderful opportunity for create creation. And some people should not be creators. I'm not saying that that's any of you, but uh, I would restrain from putting an excessive amount of time into the graphical design or adding fancy graphics around or playing with the color scheme. The cleaner your presentation is, the clearer your presentation is. Right? Notice that most of my presentations are black on white. Boring as snot, but it's clear. Right? And that's it. That's actually the important thing. Uh, related to that is be careful with your colors. Right? Anyone here colorblind? I don't think we have a big enough sample to have just randomly colorblind. Does anybody not know if they're colorblind? Oh, right. I have colorblind. There are some color te colorblindness tests that you can look up online. Um, you know, these like bubble diagrams with like numbers that are different colors. Did you see the numbers? Yes. You're not colorblind, so you're okay. All right. But the truth is, a matter, if you get a big enough audience, there's going to be a few people who are colorblind or have some degree of colorblindness. Uh, and so you might completely miss out on some important, pertinent information because they can't actually see the color that you're plotting. But there's also colors that just don't match very well and have very good contrast or very hard to read on top of each other. So just be careful with color. Color is still useful because this is a way of, you know, highlighting different things. But, you know, used to the extreme, it can be <coughs> very headache-inducing. So keep that in mind. Um, so a bad example of this slide is to reduce your text on your slide. This is a terrible example of that. There's a lot of text on the slide. But I'm spending a lot of time on the slide, so that's okay. But you don't have a lot of time. So you want to make sure that you're not just 
putting all of your conversation up here and importantly then going so make sure you're careful with your color and um, you want to reduce the text on your slide and uh, maybe have some notes uh, but this is a pretty bad example um, talk to us oh talk to us Okay, so don't read. So one way to prevent yourself from reading your slide is not to have anything on there to read, right? Because uh, it's a, it's an easy crush to have you know text up there. So you're you're up here and you're like panicking and so okay, I'm gonna look what I have to read. Try to re avoid that by not having text up there. You can have a sheet of notes. That's perfectly okay. I don't mind having people having notes, um, but just make sure it's not up here. The other reason this is a bad idea is that right now most of you are reading, and you're not paying attention to me. Please pay attention to me. Hey, I'm the speaker. Hi. Perfectly natural. If you have text up on the screen, people are going to read it, and they're not going to actually listen to what you're saying. So the more that you can say the text and not put it up here, the more that, that the audience will actually pay attention to what you're, what you're talking about. Okay? Uh, and then the most important thing that I think throws everyone off is you've got to make sure you practice your, your talk. Um, and that means you know practicing on your own, practicing in front of your roommates, Practicing on the street for random people, see what they do, right? Anything. But just practice it, time yourself, figure out how long it actually takes to get through this talk, and make sure you get down to about five minutes. You know, the truth of the matter is, depending on what kind of speaker you are, if you practice and it's five minutes, when you actually give it, it might end up being three minutes, or it might end up being ten minutes, right? Um, but at least try to aim for five minutes by, by practicing it and getting to that point. Yes? Um. Obviously a lot of text below, yeah. just a little text on the slide. Um, getting the audience to read it out loud together, like just like you know, a simple sentence or something. Get to pinch off that slide back to you and just talk to the member. That that's I, I, that sounds like a fun thing to do. Audience participation is great. So yeah, if you want to do that, that could be fun. If you want to get them to sing along, that'd be even better. Yeah. And can you read last last for a slide? I mean three minutes. Um, well, I mean, it's so it's a good point. So if you're, you know, if you're a minute, if you come up here, put a slide up, and you're done. Uh, well, okay, we need a little bit more. What's going to happen is then is that the the question answer period will be longer, right? So my aim is to have about seven minutes per person up here. So five minutes is presentation, two minutes is questions. So if you come and do one minute, then you got six minutes of asking questions, and I'll ask a lot of questions at that point. Hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> If you're, you know, if you're three or four minutes, that's fine. If you're, um, if you're going on to like seven, eight, ten minutes, I will come up and stop you. So that's what happens in conferences. This is what this happens all the time in conferences. Like you, you have five, ten, fifteen minutes to talk, and people will just keep talking, and they don't realize, wow, ten minutes is a short amount of time. Five minutes is a really short amount of time. So this is really like bam, bam, bam. This is what I did. This is the context. This is what I did. Here's the results. I will have. I may have a buzzer. I may have a clock of some kind just to let you know. I may have flags. That's what we do for the undergraduate research conferences uh, to let you know that you're running out of time. And if you're still talking at seven minutes, I will come up and stand next to you and make you feel uncomfortable so that you stop. But you know that's that is part of the organization of the talk. So that will factor in there. So that's why practicing is important. Making sure you can get it down in five minutes. If you're within a few minutes, of that's fine. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Okay, so two questions. One is, um, do you need to cite equations like stuff that we did in class, like proper motion and stuff like that? So really basic equations like that. They're like almost definitional equations. You don't really have to cite those. But if it's, you know, if it's, um, well, if it's an initial mass function, for example, then that comes from somewhere. That comes from Sal Peter et al. 1955. So. Those are the kind of places where you want citations. The easiest thing is if it's an equation that comes from your reading, if there's no citation to the equation in your reading, that's probably a generic equation that's just been around for so long. Um, if there isn't a, a citation, you should include that citation if you use that equation in the talk. But, um, second question. Yeah. If you're, like, the plot in the paper has colors that are really weird, should you just... Just to be safe, stick with like a black and white image. Oh no, no. So I, I should be getting, color is great. Color is very. I mean, we are fortunate to have color sensitive eyes, most of us, and so it. Well, I mean, yeah, so everyone does. So it's really important to have that, and it, and it provides. 
it really enriches, you know, focus where you're looking, comparing things. So if the figure in the, in the, in the paper has a color, then yeah, definitely use it, for sure. And, you know, you can add color to the figures, too. Just don't go too far on that. Okay? All right. Any other questions on, on any of this stuff? Do you, wanna, do you have any other things you want to add? Uh, the tendency when you're practicing a speech or any kind of presentation is that when you actually get it, you go to the easy to rush. So if you're a little over five minutes, since it's during the presentation, that's so that's that's usually the case. You're right. Most 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 people will <coughs> will get up here and then they will speed talk, and that's part of clarity. Is you know, if if you if if you're prone to that or you're not sure if you're prone to that, uh, the best thing to do is just when you switch the slide, take a deep breath. Click right, all right. While well, it's clicking or something like that, that will help slow you down a little bit. Um, but I also have seen cases where people are just they get up here and they're like, oh, and let me tell you this other story that I heard. Uh, well, okay, and it's too much, right? So, uh, so you're, you're right. Most cases people go too fast, but I would not plan for more than five minutes because you may end up going much, much more than five minutes, which is bad. You hear me? Thank you. No. Uh, in terms of the color mm -hmm. if you are typing up equations and you want to show an equation, um, sometimes in the different formats, equations get misplaced. So if you're, it's best if you take a picture of the equation and stick it on your slide rather than actually typing it out in the program. Yeah. Just think about the formatting that I can remember. And just in general, having equations, some people love that. They will just be very boring. Mm -hmm. I guess it's up to you. Mm -hmm. It depends a little bit on your project. I mean, some projects, some some of the projects you guys have are theoretical, so there probably will be one or two equations. But you know, if it's an endless slide of equations, I will lose it. Like I'm, I just won't. I can't follow that. Equations are hard to read. You know, they're very information-rich things. We don't even know what to call them. They're not pictures. They're not text. They're like things, right? That take a long time to process. So keep that in mind if you if you have an equation. Any other questions or ideas that we haven't covered? Yeah. I guess this is more of a style thing, but some people, um, when they're practicing for the freedom of the over practice, the point where it sounds like you're just reading out the script. Mm -hmm. And it's really going to lose people's attention if it sounds like you're just typing. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have notes, you should have notes that just help you. You know, you notice when I, when I teach or when I'm talking here, I'm going around and I'm looking at different people across the room. And that helps keep me sort of read, say, oh, you're falling asleep, so I should probably maybe, I don't know, make a big sound uh, or step it up a little bit. Or, wow, your face looks like you're completely confused by what I'm saying, so I must have done something wrong. Or you're like this, so I must have done something completely wrong. So it's good to read the audience that way, but it also helps keep people connected. Because if I'm staring at you, it's very hard to fall asleep. I keep staring at you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think that's a good comment center. Is you know, be live when you're giving a talk. And you know, I know this. You know, this took it took. I've been doing this for many, many years. If you saw me teach when I first taught, I was like, this I use my stuff. You know, it takes a long time to get practice on that. But you know, we are an accepting family of students here. So don't be too nervous. We're, this is a safe place. OK? All right. All right, so, um, so I want to move on to some examples of bad behavior. Um, these are all slides that I have given in uh, talks over the last 10 years. So it's examples of my bad behavior, but they're good illustrative examples of what a lot of people do. Um, and so your job uh, for this is to interrupt me when you think that Either the slide or how I'm presenting the slide could use some improvement or a change. And let me know what that change is and suggest a, suggest a change for it. OK? All right, ready? All right, so I'm going to talk about brown dwarfs. And um, so this is uh, evolution of brown dwarfs. And um, uh, so the, the models run that way. And on this, and then um, if they get to this point up here, 
uh, they start to fuse hydrogen um, around uh, 3 million Kelvin, uh, which is up there. And then, um, and then it is, yeah. Um, okay, that's, that's a good one. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. All right. I'll look at you. Oh, I should have some contact. I forgot my contacts. Yes. Okay. So brown dwarf is a, is a very low mass star that's so low mass it can't fuse hydrogen in its core. And, and oh, and this, that's really, this plot is what, I, what actually demonstrates that. I forgot to mention that. But okay, so that's what happens here. So I'll take a look at you guys. Okay, so so that's what that plot is. And then um, if you have a mass less than um, 0.075 solar masses, uh, degeneracy kicks in, and you no longer have a star. You have something that's that's substellar that doesn't use hydrogen. Okay, um, and then uh, oh yeah, and then it can't sustain hydrogen burning. Yeah, why? Why? <laughs> so is that that's your question is why? Can we um, can you re 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 can you focus that equation that question down to something that I did or didn't do? You talked about the certain mass of gems, the holes and stuff, and then you say cannot sustain hydrogen burning. How are those two related? Okay. Um, I'm trying to think if I could steer this into the presentation part of it. You have a chain reaction from when you're saying. Well, I mean, not for no reason, but it just doesn't make sense in a way that it cannot sustain. So why is why doesn't it make sense? It's deceiving because for hydrogen fusion, you need to change. And the other thing is that it flows, like it flows to the connect. Okay. So it wasn't like this leads to this. Yes. Yeah. It was like the verbal equivalent of a laundry list. You were just listing a bunch of crap and expecting us to. Like, usually when you're talking, you lead us through a thought process. Yeah. And you're like putting emphasis into it, you're putting in. in you're making us think what you want us to think and actually put some. But here you're just talking in like one plateau and then yeah. giving us a list of information that we don't really care about. <laughs> Good point, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know, it's really hard to see the so, okay, there's a color issue. Yellow on white, not very good. How about, do you know what this figure is? Did I explain that? Would it, would it might have been helpful? For this why question, if I explain what this figure actually is, can you can you do you have an idea what this figure is? You kind of guess it, right? But you 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 know, if, while I'm talking, you might be spending five minutes going, okay, let me see if I can figure out what the hell that figure is, and, and you're not listening to me. So you know, what I can do is say, okay, so this is a figure. Uh, from uh, Shiv Kumar, 1963. This figure comes from the paper that uh, first theoretically predicted brown dwarfs. Uh, and what this figure shows is core density along the x-axis on a log scale, uh, and then the core temperature also on a log scale on the y-axis here. And, um, and each of these lines are models for how a ball of gas collapses down and it goes in this direction because you're going towards increasing density. Right? So as it collapses, the density gets uh, higher because the object gets smaller. And uh, each of these lines corresponds to a different mass, which are labeled in solar masses up here. Uh, and um, as they progress down here, if you remember what we did in class, we talked about degeneracy pressure. Oh, see the connection to class, right? And, and how that was related to the density and the temperature of the gas. So this line traces the degeneracy limit, right? When material goes from being ideal to degenerate. And you can see that these lines, when they reach this part, they stop heating up uh, as they collapse. They just sort of stay at the same temperature. And that's because all the energy is going into the degeneracy of the gas and not, you know, heating up the gas like an ideal gas. Now, if these objects don't reach this line, uh, which is about 3 million Kelvin, which is the ignition temperature for the proton-proton chains, that's the first, first uh, reaction for the proton-proton chain. If they don't get to that point because they turn over because they hit this degenerate limit, they'll never get that hot. And if they never get that hot, they'll never start hydrogen fusion. And that's the mass at which that happens, about 0.075 solar masses. If they're less massive than that, they never get hot enough for fusion, and so they can't sustain hydrogen fusion. Is that a little clear? So the main thing I changed was I, I interacted with this figure. And I explained very clearly what this was. Because this figure is the key to going from a laundry list to an actual logical thought process. 
But one other thing that I mentioned was the animations, right? So you notice as I step through, I like all of these things came up one at a time. Yeah, they weren't very useful animations. I mean, they were, you know, those little actions seemed like it's live. But what it caused me to do is that I would get, I would see this, and I would sort of react to just that one thing, and then I would see that, and I would react. It can drive you into not showing the whole picture, which turns into kind of a laundry list, right? So it's, you know, a lot of people will have the emerge, you know, the appearing text to sort of drive the flow of the discussion, but you know. You, don't, you can read this any rate you want. The fact that it's all up there is I can make connections between it, as opposed to it being forced to go one at a time. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Um, citation question. Yeah. Do you have the source listed on the slide? Do you still want to, like, this is from 2 in to 2 3 um, It's helpful. And you notice the, you know, the other thing I inserted here when I mentioned the citation was that I said what the paper was about. So that provides a little more context of, you know, why, why, do, why did I show this plot? Well, it's useful to explain the physics, but it's also historically relevant because this was the paper that, you know, defined what brown dwarfs are theoretically. So it becomes a, an important plot because you have a little context for, for not just the figure, but also where it came from. Right? And also, you know, it's 1963, so that was a long time ago. So when I usually give this talk, I say, well, then, then my, I don't come around to the 90s, and we still don't have brown dwarfs then, so it sort of gives a context for that. So it's up to you. I mean, you can just have it if it's not, a, if it's not an interesting paper. You know, if it's just, that's just where the figure came from. You don't have to call it out. But in this case, this is a, a very relevant paper. This is the first paper on brown dwarfs, so it's, it's worth pointing out. You know, having little historical tidbits and stories are also very good for presentations. You don't have a lot of time for it. Like a long story, so you know, like, and I met actually last, you know, like last time last year in Germany, I was in Germany. I met Shiv Kumar, and he's still around, and you know, he's a really funny guy. He just like blames everyone for not calling him Kumar dwarfs, and it's really hilarious. Great story and true, uh, but not relevant, and I don't have time, right? So, so you know, pick your stories where you can have them. All right, anything else you see in this? Yeah, that's it. Seemed like you were surprised that you had that last. That you said, "Oh, yeah," and it counts the same. So, if you're putting something on your slide, and nobody was there, I'm surprised by it. Yeah, yeah. You prepared to say a little something about it because you have it there for a reason. Yeah, yeah. That happens a lot if you have animated text. So sometimes it's hard to see that's coming up, and so then you're like, "Oh, there's one more thing that I forgot to mention." If you just have it up there, it's there, right? It's not like I'm hiding something from you. So that's that's another reason to think about. If you have an animation, do you really need that animation? What's the purpose of the animation? Are you actually showing something in motion, or are you just kind of directing the flow of the talk? In which case, it actually can work against you at some level. OK? All right. I'm going to go on to my next slide. <sighs> Taking a breath. All, right. All right, so, uh, so Brown Dwarfs were predicted in the 1960s. And then um, there was uh, a whole bunch of searches to look for them. So in 1982, there was a paper by Probst and O'Connell uh, where they did imaging around white dwarfs. Uh, and then they did near infrared imaging to see if they could find the, the sort of excess from this brown dwarf around the white dwarf. And they didn't find anything. Um, and then uh, Probst then went on the next year, and actually two papers did that again <laughs> and did it around some other white dwarfs. That still didn't work out. And then uh, the same year, uh, Jameson, Sherrington, and, and Giles also did the imaging around the white dwarfs. Yes? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Why? You're just going off the list. There's so much writing. And yeah. You're talking really fast. I'm just saying um stuff. So. so I have to say um is is a is a that that's actually what I do all the time. So that's <laughs> that's, that's that's. But thank you for pointing it out. This is still a problem. Yeah. Did you really get this on slide? Oh yeah. This was on uh, my thesis. Uh, <laughs> this is my thesis talk. Uh, now I should say when when I so I put this up on a slide. It there. Are, so I gave all these sort of suggestions and not rules, but sort of good good practice. Um, sometimes you can break them if there's a purpose. So the purpose of the slide was actually not to sit here and read all the different studies, was to really show that people just did this for such a long time that you know it's it's a mess, right? It's they they failed, they failed, and they failed, and they failed, and they failed. And that's what I would do. I wouldn't go and read the slide. I would just say, and and then people went off and and nothing. They did all this work and nothing. And that's it, right? So there's an effect, but of course it's also still bad. It's not good design. 
Is there another reason why this is not good design? Yeah. That's true, too. There's a lot of text here. I mean, actually, there's so much text, you may stop reading this and start paying attention to me, because you might be glaring at me and say, are you really doing this? Right? Are you really, can you stop? Um, so yeah, that, that is another issue. <laughs> yeah, so this is, uh, this is exactly how I showed this when I gave the you know, piece talk. Uh, and this is one of the standard PowerPoint sort of, you know, slide designs. It's terrible, right? The standard PowerPoint slide designs are not, not always good. So, you know, don't just use the defaults. Um, but yeah, it's very hard to read. You know, I could have bolded the text to make it better. I could change it to white. That would have been better. But, yeah. Okay. Any, anything else? Yes? Um, by having so many searches up there, I kind of lose the impact of each one specifically. So mm -hmm. if we were to talk about one of them, I might feel like I buy that value. And so what, what could I do to make to, to if, let's say I wanted to talk about, um, let's say I want to talk about this one right here. Wait, do I want to talk about this one? Yeah, I want to talk about this one. So I want to talk about this. What could I do? You have only that one on the slide. So I could have just that one on the slide, yeah. You make it bold. I could make it bold. You could stand out. Yeah, I could. I could change the color. I could put a box around it. I could, like, sort of uh, decontrast all the other text so that you just see this one, right? So there, there are ways that you know there are ways to do an effect like this where look, look at all this crap, and then oh, wait, this one's actually important. <coughs> You can do that visually. Yeah. You can also like, categorize them. Like so many people, like five people did either spectrum. Like, yeah. So that would be a little more organized to say, well, look, look, there's like you know six of these that are searches for white dwarfs. Why don't you say there were six studies for white dwarfs in the long bit? Again, part of it was you know part of it was my choice to do this effect, which was not you know clearly doesn't work, right? Because it's annoying as hell. Um, but but that would be one way of reducing the amount of text. Okay. Any other suggestions to improve the, my, my talk? Oh, good. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, what the hell? What? Like the lab? Let's let's go back a slide. I don't have a page number. Now I have a page number. That's kind of inconsistent. Now, if you're so, I would say this is a pretty minor thing, right? If you're really like focused on the slide number, then I've really lost you. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. No. So that's a visual distractor yeah. for you. Yeah. You keep looking at it. I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so that's a good example of do I need do I really need a slide number on here if that's distracting me? No. I don't need a slide. I only got five slides. So. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to cap you, but I'm going to cap you on time. So depends on your presentation style. Okay, I'll do an I'll I'll do an example, but not yet. So can I can I go on to my next? Uh, okay. All right. Um, so this is some spectra of uh, of brown dwarfs, and um, these are M dwarfs and these are L dwarfs. So going on. Uh, so this is uh, now what? Go back. Oh no, I was done with that. We were. We were. Oh, all right. Can I go on now? What? What is the? What are those? Well, these are spectra. Oh. Oh, oh, so maybe I should I should give a little more detail on this. Yeah, okay. All right. So um, so these are these are near infrared spectra, all right? So you know it's sort of near infrared regime, one to two and a half microns. And um, and these are just different individual objects which are labeled by these names here. And these are their spectral types. And um, I just sort of highlighted that these are these are sort of the M up here and these are L dwarfs up here. And the differences that are between them uh, that distinguish between these classes, if you look at like this region right here, which is water absorption, it gets much stronger as you get down into the L dwarfs. Um, you have stuff like iron hydride, which are these two little faint bumps that come in. Uh, that's something we see in the L dwarfs. Uh, the spectra over here start to change shape. So these are all illustrations of how 
you go from M dwarfs to L dwarfs in spectroscopy. Why? Why does water absorb so much green? Like, what's the difference between? Like you explain what why the spectra are different, but why are the actual um, like what what are the spectra explaining? Like how are they connected to the Ah, okay. So maybe one thing that could help this is I could have a uh, arrow that says that this is decreasing temperature. Right. So water gets stronger because the temperature gets gets lower. So you have more molecules in the atmosphere, and so the absorption, which scales as how much stuff you have, gets deeper. Another way I could have improved this. A little bit. Um, <clears throat> so you could have a title. So titles um, can work both ways. The title is text, so you know it's another thing that draws your eyes. That for briefly you may not be listening to me. It's entirely up to that's that's a style thing. So titles titles or no titles are are, are really but up to you. It it helps with context though. Yeah. Just yeah. Okay. Okay. There's some other other design things that might might help this a little bit. What time is it? Because it seems kind of like the three L dwarf spectra. Like you could choose one that would give you the most, like the same amount of information as all three of them. Yeah. So maybe maybe decreasing the complexity of the figure. You know, I described some of the features. One thing is that, so I said, okay, here's water, and then I moved on. Is it still clear where water is? Yeah, I could, I could put like a, a shaded box over here, and maybe have it for the maybe. So this is water, and this is water. So maybe I have two shaded boxes, which is the same color. Maybe I can have another shaded box that indicates where uh, the sodium line happens. And, and then it becomes a lot easier to say, okay, if I look at the sodium line, oh, actually, it, that also changes. There's a sodium line there and there, but it's kind of gone, and then it's definitely gone as we go down here. So that might help guide the eye. So, you know, particularly when you have complex data like this, the spectral data, which are very, you know, I stare at this, I know exactly what I'm looking at, but I've been doing this for 20 years, right? This is probably the first time we've ever seen these spectra all together. And so to just look at this and get all the complexity is very hard. But if I can guide what I want you to actually see. Instead of looking at all of this, what I really want you to see is just this band. I can just color this band, and then it becomes much more clear. One more thing about this slide that's, that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, before I started doing the slides. Where does this figure come from? Yeah, I, I have no information about where this came from. Did I make this? Did someone else make this? Did I just download this off the web? Is this from a publication? Is this just someone like, you know, some crank just made this and I thought this looked pretty so I'm using it? Like, there needs to be some, some branding of what this figure is. You know, is this a real scientific figure or is this just something I just made up? So that's another place where references come in. Um, okay, let's do one more real quick. This one is too obvious. Uh, except I think. Okay, I'll save. The, I'll do this one. So the so you know color, right? I should explain what this is. It's this is very complicated. So I have to spend some time explaining what that is. But color is the big one, right? Can't read any of that. Uh, this is just a super complicated plot that has no labels on it really whatsoever. It's got a reference, and it's very important. But there's a lot going on in this. So these kind of really complicated plots that have a lot of information information dense, just like the spectral plot, it's very good to highlight the places where you really want people to focus. So maybe putting these are actually the regions where clouds are in L dwarfs. It might be good just to color those in because those are the things you should look at. For example, yeah. Do you think it might be more uh, useful to do those like, highlights live rather than you know, already on? Well, so again, again, it's you know, like as letting them come in as you're talking about it. So you have to think, what's the purpose of having that animation? Is it to guide the? Is it to direct the presentation? In that case, it's not that great of a reason. If it's to indicate an evolution, 
that's where animation comes really. If something changes and you want to show how that changes, that might be a good animation. But if you just want to say, here's where you want to pay attention, put them right away. So that, you know, when you look at this first time, you're like, holy crap, I don't know what, what's going on here. But if right away I have the color regions where I want you to look, then it's, then it's okay. Well, I don't know what's going on, but at least I know I should look there. Um, oh, then I have lots of animations. Okay, that should be obvious. Uh, here's a good one. <laughs> so this is um, the expansion of gravity uh, to uh, six orders uh, of C, right? So going from Newtonian gravity to general relativity. Uh, and so here's our Newtonian gravity term right here. Uh, here's the first expansion term. Uh, you get these terms that expand as mass uh, and the two components, mass one and m two. Uh, there's this n value here uh, that's uh, sort of a, a reduced mass of the system. Uh, there's velocity uh, of the two components. <coughs> Can I, do you want to stop? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is a bit of an extreme example, right? Uh, but you know, equations take a long time to explain. I only got through like this part. Uh, it takes a long time to explain equations. So be very careful with equations. They take a lot of work to explain. They can be very confusing, especially when they look like this. Um, and only, I would say only have an equation if it's really essential to the, the point you're trying to discuss and make it very clear what everything means in it. Right? It's just like a figure in the sense that you have to tell me what N's and B's and M's and G's and stuff are. Because I may not use the same the letter convention that you use for, for equations. So you really have to treat it like a figure where you explain where everything is. Maybe even have labels that come off and say, this is gravity, this is mass, you know? Indicate them in, in English words. So think really closely about your equations. Okay, that's it. I think we're out of time. Uh, any other questions before we go? Any other thoughts that came to you about what we should all look out for or Things you're worried about? I don't know. I actually did this presentation last year. <laughs> and uh, this was for uh, a physics and dance talk. So using phys physics equations to drive and design dances. And so I, I demonstrated one that's based on Newtonian gravity. And then I said, if you really want a really complicated dance, oh. there you go. So here's another case where you can break the rules for an impact. Do that. Yeah, exactly, right. So I don't expect anyone in the dance audience that I was talking to to understand what the hell this is at all, right? But it's meant to convey complexity, and and that was the point. You know, I spent 20 seconds on the slide. It becomes a picture at some level. Yeah. Uh, Dress non-distractingly. Yes, you, sh you you can say that based on your <laughs> Halloween costume. Yes, <laughs> that helps. You don't have to dress super formally, right? We're in San Diego. I don't care. Uh, but yeah, you know, I I haven't seen an example of someone dressing so distractingly. That's a problem. But but I guess it could happen. So so don't do it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you can say, so I mean, it's not really a citation, so you don't have to have a citation there, but you can say, and so I took this data and I made this, this figure. Yeah. Unless you plan to publish it, then you should put I hear it all, you know, in prep. Okay. All right. See you tomorrow. <laughs>